Money and Me on Your Money, only on Money FM 89.3. Why should companies be looking at women aged over 50 as prime candidates? Um, what can a working mother bring to the workplace that more employers should be aware of? I'm speaking with a serial entrepreneur. She is a dynamic force. I know you're going to love her. She's founder of Elevate, and she's quite a force in person and on LinkedIn, as well as a voice championing change for women across all levels of society. It is my pleasure to welcome Jing Jin Liu. How are you? Yay! Michelle Marty, <laughs> I cannot believe I'm here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm great. I know you are great. <laughs> I feel great. <laughs> and especially to be with you in the room. Jing Jin Liu in three words. What would that be? Wow, that's a tough question. Progressive, controversial, and um, always challenges the school. Cool. I know that's not all three words. <laughs> I tried. <laughs> you did try. You grew up in China, in Germany. You're an active angel investor. You're currently founder of Elevate, and we'll get into that in a while. But do you think growing up in these two very different countries and cultures have shaped your ideas on women at work? Uh, massively. So I, so I was the weird girl in China. I was quite was uh, extroverted. I was not good in academics. And I asked a lot of questions, why this, why that, why should we carry short hair, for example, as girls in school? So I was the bad girl in, in, uh, in China. So everyone was like, okay, you cannot be friends with her. She's too loud, too noisy, and it's not good at school. So, you know, um, Interesting. Damned. And then I decided to move to Germany when I was 16 hmm. because I want to be in the country where individualism is more celebrated, that I can be, that I don't have to change and adapt. So in Germany, everything what I stood for that was criticized back then in China suddenly become a huge asset. They're like, oh, the Chinese girl actually spoke up and she's not muted. And I, someone was like, you know, most of the Asian Chinese we meet, they're like Hello Kitties. There's no mouse. Oh, oh, Hello Kitty, there's no yeah, mouse, right? Yeah, you're right. right. Yeah. And, um, and then so all this kind of, you know, challenges that is for asking for things, a lot of things that is not the traditional Asian norm, does not fit into the Asian norm, has been celebrated when I was in Germany. So You felt yeah, at home. I felt, well, I felt... And seen. Yeah, and seen, exactly. And heard. Both. For the first time. Yeah. And so that translates into the mission that you have now for Elevate? Yeah. So the mission at Elevate, so Elevate is a group of, so I'm the founder with Uma Chana together. And um, the Elevate is, with, we, is a group of companies with the ultimate mission to champion social justice and inclusion for women in Asia. It sounds like a non-profit, but it's 100% for-profit. Mm. And um, yeah, we do community, we, um, we have a private network that is for senior executive women to, you know, to come together, help each other. We have the business to advise companies, you know, how do you engage, how do you create a workplace that women actually want to stay and go the extra mile for you and why is that good for your company? And we have Elevate the Mind, master classes mm. for women to skills, you know, how to ask, how to get a sponsor, how to make assertiveness work for you. So we, we do everything that progress women in the workplace. You say it's a group of companies. So does this mean other companies can come on board, elevate? elevate no, it's or? essentially it's um, um, a group of companies because it takes more than just one aspect to progress women. So you have to come from the company perspective, from individual perspective, from senior leadership perspective. So, every, so we have three companies for now, the three one I mentioned, and each of them is championing, is creating a different service. So exactly. we're going to take, get to our topic in a while. But first, I want to ask you about the ask, because you held a walk recently. Yeah. Incredible turnout. Um, I think, was it more than 500 or yeah, 500? So rough, roughly, roughly 400 to 450 people. And it was a walk with a mission. And it was, um, t talk to us about it and how women were encouraged to make asks in a very concrete way yeah. during this walk. So for everyone who didn't know the walk, so the background was on the 8th of March. Uh, so three organizations came together. And so Lean In, She Loves Data, and Zaza Zoo was my previous company. And we said, enough of 8th of March that women, helping women, talking, you know, to, usually themselves. talking to themselves mm. and raising each other up. We Our source is limited. And let's be very honest, currently... 
the power in organization, in politics, in anywhere is still largely held by men. So if we really want to progress women and help women to race, you must include men. So we essentially got um, 88 C-suite men, including, for example, TC from uh, CEO of Singtel. We had Scott, president of APEC in Google. Some prominent name also joining us, and we matched each of them with two to three um, early to mid-career ladies. Okay. And the ask was for the women, okay, we matched you with a certain mechanism and asked, now you have a sponsor that walk with you around mm. for an hour. And um, now you have the chance. So ask what you need. So we actually have the, the prep work, done the prep work before, and we have to, to phrase their ask. We have to give back 80%. We have to give when we have to go back to 80% of the women and saying, uh, how can I make mentorship work for me? That's not an ask. A ask is if you were to meet um, this guy, you know, um, uh, working for Microsoft, it's the, the VP of something, you look at her, his network and say, I'm currently in data science, but I actually really want to move into another segment. And I look at your connection. There are three people. And uh, my background is the following. Could you introduce me? That is a concrete ask. So that's largely also a language that men understand. Mm. Because men ask sponsorship internally, externally, all the time. Mm -hmm. And as women, so certain, I think that's, um, it's across the world, it's not just an Asian phenomenon, is that we feel as a default, oh, can I ask? Am I a Who am I to ask? Who am I to ask? Mm. Exactly. Yeah. Mm. So that was a great turnout um, that Many women got sponsored, but even after the walk, we were follow on with the men, and many men are telling us, oh, um, we, I offered help, but they never follow up. Oh. And we were like, oh, my God, why didn't they follow up? Mm. And then we went back to the women. Women like, oh, can I, I mean, he already spent an hour with me. Can, can I, I go ask back for and even ask more? again? Mm. And I would say, woman, <laughs> <laughs> he already gave you the permission, but maybe he thinks he has to. Don't sing for him. Right. Yeah. The guy gave you the commission. So the door is open. It. Now walk through it. Yes. But also we have to tell men because for men, mm. if a man were to ask sponsorship, yes. oh, they will, they will follow up like the hell no? mm. <laughs> until a certain extent. And then for, for, for the man who has sponsored the women, for them was like, oh, why didn't they ask? Maybe, you know, maybe it's not that appealing. So for them was like, okay, this woman, in a way, does mm. not follow up, is maybe not a good candidate oh for anything. So there was a mismatch in communication as well. So women need to learn to speak men. I know this is not a popular opinion, but for at least speak the language that, you know, the one who holds power and position, privilege, when you find a sponsor, speak their language. I love that. Women need to speak men. <laughs> 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 All right, let's look at our topic. If women made decisions not from the periphery of a, an, an unequal playing field at the workplace, but from centers of power, what do you think would change, Jingjin? Mm. I think a, the world will change. I was not only from a workplace perspective. If you think about it, if more women would have the political power, for example, were more on the president, the country, the, uh, the country had counselors, um, I think there will be less war. Look at the startup field. If there are more women as entrepreneurs, you know, I'm sure there will be less money raised, less revenue, but more profitability. Because mm -hmm. women have a very different focus than hustle, let's raise, 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 and then make more losses than revenue. Mm -hmm. Just look at some of the companies. From a corporate perspective, if women were to decide, have more decision power, firstly, profitability increases. There is some um, women, the, the focus of women is to make sure, this is coming from caveman's age, that, you know, everyone at the end of the day take more home so they can foster, they can nurture, they can, so everyone can live a good life. And there's less ego involved versus men. This is just, this is just how we were brought up. I'll say. And you speak also as a founder and someone who mentors and gives her time to women-led startups yeah. as well, right? What do you think would change in terms of workplace dynamics if women made changes to the workplace? You will give a lot of permission, mm. I think, for men. We talk a lot about equality, right? But it's always about women to catch up, you know, like get more women to the leadership role, get more women into, you know, equal positions. They are so important. But we should also talk about, you know, getting more men to, you know, stay at home, 
to do the caregiving work. And you will be surprised. A lot of men, they want? actually want to stay at Absolutely. home, to spend more time with their kids, to do their side project instead of there is only one career path because I have to be the breadwinner because I can't let my wife carry the burden. It's not even a burden. You know, how would society see me if women were to have more power in the workplace? I will say, okay, uh, 5 p.m., for example, 5 to, uh, 5 to 6.30, we used to have that in the previous company. It's, uh, so she, so the CEO said, in German um, listed company, she said 5 to 7, we will, have, we will have no meetings just by default because this is the time where women uh, pick up their kids. Mm. And they will be surprised how many men took that to say, okay, now it's also give permission for them to pick up the kids or to do something outside of the workplace. And you will, and more inclusion, and um, and women will design the workplace in a way that is comfortable or that is um, appealing for more people. For example, we had this uh, or working with or- organization, and uh, billion dollar company, uh, fintech company, and um, uh, some of the women they were pumping milk in the in the restaurant in the restaurant, and I was uh, chatting with them. Why? Why didn't you ask again? They were mm. like, Oh, we didn't know that we can ask. So I had the chat with the president, who is a man, mm. who 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 have young kids, but his wife happened to not happen to not work. Mm-mm. And then he said, "I told him, why don't you have you have a ping pong room, you have you know skinker room, you have so many fun rooms in the office. Why don't you have a nursing room?" Mm. He said, "Oh, why do I need that? Because from his perspective, he's not a man, he's not a woman, and his leadership are mainly m- men, so he didn't even know. So when I brought it up." And they immediately implemented. Mm -hmm. So in the moment, imagine now if a female employee or a female leader were in his leadership team, she would have brought it up. Do you think, though, that there are sort of um, cultural, attitudinal, also structural issues that um, prevent women from being able to ask? For example, I remember being in a situation where I was in a professional situation and thinking that, okay, I'm going to ask for the help that I need in order to get a certain task done. And literally, literally, the answer was, and this was not a male superior, Mm. it was a female superior, Mm. Who are you to ask? Mm. Literally. Mm. So, you know, there are dynamics of power. There are ego plays that come into it. A man who is asking is seen as confident. A woman who's asking is seen as someone who's outside her lane or too aggressive. Mm. So what do, you, what do you say to women who are facing these dynamics at the workplace where they have no problem with opening up and asking, but the response that's coming back is pretty aggressive? Yeah. So I think, I mean, this this is this is a larger topic now. Generally, when you have a leader and he or she does not have the open mind, and then the woman who actually asks something and get a pushback, like in your case, um, it's difficult to ask indeed. But I think I will always ask the question back, and that of course that's take gut. <laughs> no, I think okay. Then I will answer that question. Who are you to ask? If this works with me, I was like, okay, I am a product manager and need to get this task done, and I need to have this kind of support so that I can get this task done, which actually largely contribute to your KPI as manager as well. So you actually have to politely push back I would say. Mm. And uh, everyone has to do it in their own way. It's, it comes with a lot of uh, practice, though. Absolutely. Um, how might the inclusion of more women in leadership roles, do you think, affect company culture and also corporate morale? <laughs> so there's uh, many, many studies saying, you know, women are more for social change, mission-driven task. Let it be, you know, just look at this investment space. If women, female, if women were to invest into anything, um, 89% of women will only invest in companies that has a social mission, whereas only 29% men would do that, actually. And the same is mm. valid for the corporate world. Mm. So when we make decisions for who do we hire, when we make decisions, what do we invest, when it's yep. cost-cutting, um, what do we get rid of? Do we get rid of people first or do we get rid of you know, some unnecessary expenses first? Mm-hmm. So women will think things more from a huma- humanity perspective, and whereas men are trained grow up differently and the cultural impact as well, would you mention? You are a serial entrepreneur and the first company or one of the first companies that you started in China, you, uh, in Germany, excuse yeah. me, you made an exit for. So you know what VCs are looking for. For the female-led companies out there, um, 
and the VCs listening in, are female-led companies the better investment? Hell yes! <laughs> <laughs> there are, uh, hell, hell yes. And there are so many, so many reasons for that. I think uh, women in general um, over-deliver and under-promise. So, and then, so if women, when you have men and women pitch, I have seen hundreds of pitches in the meanwhile as an active angel investor and uh, as an advisor for companies. Men sell usually a dream, and that is often, and they're excellent at it. Yes. And women sell a reality, reality what they believe is going to happen. And often, unfortunately, reality is not as sexy or as as sexy and Beautifully as viable, put. Yes. especially in the VC world, because there is no 100x. Mm. Simple as it is. Yeah. There is a 10x, but a steady 10x. So the VC world actually needs to, of course, not every company is for a VC exit or VC investment. And very often, the data is also skewed because a lot of female-driven company, they are not VC backable because they are steady, they make profit, they make, they are profitable in years one, year two. But we see that, okay, we don't need profitability. We need actually growth. So you better make losses mm. so that we can pull more money. So we grow revenue. Look at some of the big companies, not without naming them. Mm -mm. They're making some more losses than revenue. But that's VC backable because they fulfill the 100x, the 10x, the whatever mandate they have. So interesting, this VC playbook. And whereas the one female-driven company, they say, okay, we play steady. It's not we are risk aware, not risk averse. So I would say this is we. If I were to draw a ten-year plan, that's yeah. more realistic. This is much more likely to happen versus when the men sell you a dream with a lot of things. Let it be AI, let it be crypto. Of course, these things are more scalable, but mm -hmm. they are selling you a dream. And unfortunately, people um, often in the case we see are still very male-driven industry. So they buy into the narrative that men sell versus when women in the moment where you sell yourself a little bit smaller because more realistic. All this kind of mitigation question is going to come in. Oh, how do you mitigate risk? In the moment, the growth of the company is deducted into, you know, oh, how do you prevent risk happening? Where else they ask the male founders, oh, the 100x. So mm -hmm. when do you think you need the next you know, man, uh, um, um, capital injection? So you, they will ask very different questions. Do you think this perspective on risk-taking also translates to how women invest? Are women better investors? Hell yes! <laughs> 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 yeah. So, whether this, uh, I, so I, I, there are four aspects of why women are the better investors. So women are um, risk-aware, again, is that women don't jump easily into, you know, into investment they don't understand. So they will only get into funds or portfolios as they will let someone explain, the professional or themselves. They will only invest when they understand. Whereas men, you know, we may have this conversation, you know, in, uh, in, uh, in the professional network. Mm -hmm. And uh, men are more likely to jump into, you know, some, oh, this is trendy currently. What do you think? And then from a long-term investment perspective, if you jump too often, sell and buy too fast, too often, the likelihood for you to not have um, a, a profitable yield per year is just much higher. And women are just more, okay, let this sit you know, I'm rather looking into 10 years when my kids go to university, that's going to support their fund. Absolutely. So not about the big game. Yeah. So, and then lastly, women are more likely to listen to advices. Because men, if something they don't understand, they'll say, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's valid for the boardroom as well, no? By the, or anywhere. Men are more inclined not to ask if mm. things they don't understand. Mm -hmm. So women are saying, oh, if I don't understand, I'm going to ask for it. So uh, no, shame to, no, no shame to ask. I don't understand. What does that mean? Then you get into the bottom of the things, which give you more clarity and create, yeah, create more, um, yeah, with clarity, you create more visibility. One area I think that women don't, and, and that's changing yeah. uh, in, in a big way, um, but money for some women has been something that um, they may not touch or handle, at least, uh, you know in some households. But then I think back to old Singapore in the 1970s, my grandparents' generation, and actually it was the women who were the banks of the house. Mm. You know, the men would give their paycheck to the women yeah. and the women would figure out the yeah. household expenditure and everything. Yeah. But what do you think women in this generation need to know about money? Yeah, exactly the opposite of what you just said. Because, so I always used to say, so um, women are often referred to the CFO of 
the household. Yeah. It's exactly so. The men will bring the money back and then they will spend. They will make sure next week there are enough and then give something to the kids, to the neighbor, to In the old whatever. days. In, I don't know if it days. still exists. So then, the, 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 but then what we are talking about investment is rather long term. So what happens in five years, in 10 years? So to invest into a future, yeah. which is unknown. So I think that's where, we know we talk about, again, women risk adversity and then not to make mistakes. All this n- old narrative will kick in and saying, oh, I'd rather keep it in the bank or have a very safe investment strategy, not to venture into a portfolio, let it, let it be startup, um, rather ETF or rather safer things, or not to invest at all, because yeah. I don't understand. But instead of working towards to understand it, let's just park it somewhere, because money in the bank is also a safe way. It's not lost in certain to certain extent. So... Women need to get into the position of the chief investment officer I position love that. at home. And there are actually Fidelity had made a study with five million clients, uh, men and women equally distributed, over ten year period of ten years, and find out that women outperform men forty data points. It's small, but over ten years it's still something. So investing women have a actually better sense and better understanding when they get to it. Mm. But only 27% of women in the advanced economy mm-hmm. are investor at any kind. Oh my. So that's why women, anyone who's listening, professional, the earlier that you start, the better it is. Yeah. Yeah. There's no getting around that. Working women are a big part of the Singapore workforce. For a long time, we were talking about the pipeline of working women and where women took time out to start their families. Getting back into the roles of seniority was, was not easy. Um, why should more companies hire working mothers? Um, this is a topic very close to my heart. And I think working mother is a huge asset. Working mother and women in their prime age, as in, you know, 55 beyond. Working mother, um, in the moment where a woman is seen, have a child, most of the company will see them as a liability because, you know, they just assume that women's focus is going to shift to their children. And which is not a, which is legitimate. Now, I don't want to hire any mother who say, oh my God, work is better, work is more important than my child. And by the way, that's valid for the men as well, because that's not the morale you want to have in your company, isn't it? Mm-hmm. And then mm-hmm. for women who handle kids, they are extremely sufficient because I don't have the time. Back in my corporate life, um, we have the meeting from four to five, and I was I I wasn't I was not a mother. And then the guy will debate about this and that, and oh, meeting usually overrun. And I have a project manager. And uh, she's a mother. She must leave at five. So she will come in. This is the agenda. One, two, three, four. Let's, what can we do now? What can we decide now? What information do we need to carry on? And what do we postpone, for example? Boom, boom, boom. 30 minutes, we're done. And because she said, clearly, I have a cut. She's I have got to a go. priorities. I yeah. have got a priority. So mm-hmm. I have to get shit done. Mm-hmm. So where else, um, men, if you don't have that obligation, it's mm-hmm. just, okay, you can talk forever. Valid for women. I mean, me back then have no children. It's the same. Mm-hmm. Um, and I like how you, you, you mentioned a little bit about 50 women as uh, those over 50 as a prime age. Yeah. That companies should look at so much experience invested yeah. in, in these women. And yet, um, when it comes to ageism, yeah. some women can't even get their foot in the door. Yeah. So se- sexism combined with ages. <laughs> <laughs> it's a double whammy. Yeah. Uh, what, what, can, can anything be done there? Yeah. Do you think, yeah. do you speak to women about this? A lot. I think this, I, we need to speak more to company about this than women. Yes, it, absolutely. And I think to add to the mother point, for example, was, uh, mother negotiate with the children, by the way, as well. No? So if you can convince the, the kids to eat the cucumber to vegetable, I mean, what else can what else can you not convince? <laughs> just to add on that, <laughs> you know, why should you have more mothers? And um, but back to the to the prime age. Yes, yes, yes. Um, At age of fifty five or beyond, um, most of the women in this age, the kids are grown up, or at least they are self sufficient. Mm-hmm. And um, all the hurdle, you know, all the hustle, you know, to take care of PSLE, taking care of, you know. Um, uh, play dates, uh, you know, their teenhood, all this oh. kind of thing you have to manage as a woman is, is over. 
So now you suddenly have all this space and then all this wisdom you have generated over the years. And then time. And I bet if you ask, I don't have, don't have any studies, but if you ask a woman in there, so I'm turning 40 this year, and um, if I, back in my 30s, today I'm a much better place in my 30s. And I am sure when I'm turning 50, I'll be in an even better place because just I don't give, give I don't care about so many things anymore that mm. used to bother me. Mm. You are in a better place. And as we age, especially women, yeah. there are just more wisdom. We care less about social, you know, social norms, norms you yeah. know, what others think about us, the mm -hmm. likabilities. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, we ha rather have JOMO, so joy of missing out, rather than FOMO. <laughs> I've never heard yeah, of JOMO. No, JOMO joy of, thank God <laughs> I, I was not that. invited. <laughs> thank God, you know, where else in the early age, oh my God, I'm Why not invited. Why was I left out? Yeah. Well, I left out. So mm -hmm. now you have all this wisdom, knowledge. The challenge is getting companies to recognize that this is a talent pool yeah. that is valuable. Yeah. So for that, we need a second show. What do you say, Jing Jing? <laughs> <laughs> She's Jing Jin Liu, yeah. founder of Elevate. Thank you so much for coming by. Thank you for bringing this topic on, Michelle. Always. Thank you for listening as well. This is Money and Me. I'm Michelle Martin, expanding your professional imagination when it comes to women at the workplace. Money FM 89.3